Ah, yes. It's that time of year again. We wear silly green clothes, pinch the motherfuckers who don't. We act like we know anything about Irish culture or Ireland in general. We talk about luck and leprechauns, gold and green, drinking and dumbassery. All in all, St. Patrick's Day seems like fun. Uh, and it's where we can be stupid and irresponsible. It seems like this is the only thing people like to relate to Irish culture, history, and legend. However, there are much darker legends that stay in the shadows. Ireland has a lot more than leprechauns, fairy tales, and luck. In fact, sometimes they have the exact opposite. Tonight, we will dive into the true terrifying tales that Ireland has. Tonight, we tell tales of demons, true tales of terror, and misfortune. Kick back with your pint of St. Paddy's Day beer and prepare for the sobering, scary stories of Irish history. to the Paranatural Podcast. My name is Ben. And Jacob, how are you doing tonight, brother? He didn't even get to... <laughs> I know, I fucked it all up. <laughs> what a mean I was focused too hard on the accent. <laughs> I was going to introduce myself as like Patty O'Connor or something. <laughs> you want to start over? <laughs> Do you? I don't care. <laughs> it's up to you. I mean, this will be a funny thing for, for uh, the beginning of it, right? <laughs> I would think so. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Let's go again. Will we, will we go again? All right. <laughs> 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 oh, top of the morning to you there, friends. And welcome to the Paranatural Podcast. My name is Ben. And I'm Potty O'Connor. <laughs> No, his real name is Jake. He just likes to pretend. And we are so glad to have you with us here tonight as we talk about some of Ireland's darker secrets in history. Jacob, me boy, how you doing tonight? Hi. <laughs> now I don't know if I can quit doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy boy. How you doing tonight, brother? Colorful. How are you? Um, We're doing all right. Doing all okay. right. <laughs> After we tripped up the first time, I'm just gonna leave that in. It's hilarious. <laughs> I. <laughs> so yeah, we know St. Patrick's Day is a little bit, uh, a little bit behind us now because we're a little bit behind. But we're gonna talk about Ireland anyway. But first, Benjamin. But first, we have something. We have a thing. Oh we yeah, we got thing. a review. We did. We did. We did. Glad do you, you want to read it or me? No, go ahead. Okay. I feel like I always do it. You can do it. You do always do it because people like to hear your voice more. I don't know. That's true. I do. <laughs> okay. Five stars. We're off to a good start here. Hell yeah. It's perfect. It's true. If you like spooky things but don't like pissing your pants with fear, this is the perfect way to get your fix. They talk about captivating things, freaky encounters, and some well-known places slash cryptids. The catch here is they make it fucking hilarious, and you're so busy laughing, it's easy to forget that this shit is terrifying. And that is from Alec uh, Penstemon Brooks. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks a lot, yeah. Alec. We appreciate the uh, kind words. We really do. And you're a champ. Yeah, you are. You are. And I tip my drink to you. And my hat, probably. Tink. All I right. I know you're probably listening, but we just held up the drinks and cheers. To yep. Yep, we did that. Coffee that and beer. Alec. Coffee and beer. Ah, that sounds very Irish. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I should have went with one of my darker ones. Oh, anyway. So. Okay. Darker side of Ireland. I. I. I okay. All right. So I'm not gonna try it again with the with the Irish accent. <laughs> yeah, me either. <laughs> the haunting at Cooney House. <laughs> okay. 
The Cunin ghost is considered as one of the most famous ghost, his, ghost stories in history. However, it is worth noting that this house at Cunin is not home to a normal ghost. In fact, it is much worse uh, because it is home to a poultry gizzard. It's a poultry geist. Um, a normal ghost is said to be the spirit of a dead person who can be encountered in places he or she frequented or in association with a person's former belongings. A poltergeist, on the other hand, is an entity that manifests itself by moving and influencing inanimate objects. Poltergeist really means noise-making ghost in German. That's a little... Not very uh, creative, but whatever. Um, they have a reputation of being the most dangerous type of ghost. Is that true, Ben? I mean, I guess that depends on where you're defining the line here. Uh, the black monk, Pontifrac. He didn't really do anything dangerous. Held that bitch down. Well, yeah, but didn't hurt her. What about Jeff the Talking Ultra Goose? I'm not entirely sure what he even was, so does that count? He He's just threatened clever, people a clever lot. Clever mongoose. He's a very clever little mongoose. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. The story behind the Kunin Poltergeist has been well talked about over the years. This story goes that a widow named Mrs. Murphy, her son, and five daughters. Good God, Mrs. Murphy all lived together in this house in the early part of the 20th century. Apparently, well, Mrs. Mrs. Murphy. I I think we need to, like, give a little moment of silence for Mr. Murphy. That's a died. lot of broads to live in one damn house with. How do you think he died? <laughs> Estrogen overload. <laughs> <laughs> Poor kid, probably. Okay. Um... So, Mrs. Murphy's husband died in an accident. Quote, quote, quote. Mrs. Murphy, you dirty, dirty birdie. Um, Probably because he wouldn't get off of her. <laughs> or out of her. Or out of her. Guy doesn't know the spray and pray method. Which is why they were haunted. He didn't pray... He just okay. sprayed. <laughs> he just sprayed. <laughs> uh, is that going to go on the one-liner thing? Uh, maybe. <laughs> You'll have to ask the ladies. Okay, I will. Okay. Uh, paranormal events start. Hey, look, I did it. Instead of paranormal, paranormal yeah. events started to occur in the house. It began with the occasional knocking of the front door, and when any member of the family would go to answer the door, there would be no one there. Uh, the noises then became more frequent, frequent, with knocking on all the doors and windows. Above the house was a room used to st as storage for hay. This room was only accessible by the stone staircase adjoined to the farmhouse, and in the he room, heavy footsteps were often heard, yet every time someone went to investigate, there was no one there. The family decided to get friends and neighbors to come out to the house and listen to these strange noises for themselves. Mrs. Murphy, her children, and some friends would sit in the kitchen listening to the banging. <laughs> Not the first time that house has heard it. <laughs> the banging on the windows and doors and the footsteps coming from upstairs. Unfortunately, things took a turn for the worse when more intense paranormal activity started to happen. Mrs. Murphy would watch as plates would lift off the table and fly across the room, smashing against the walls. The family would also watch their bedroom watch in the bedroom as the bed would lift several inches off the ground by itself and fall back down. Sounds a little bit like uh, Pontifract. Yeah, it is very reminiscent of Pontifract all the mm -hmm. way around. Yeah. Mm, for sure. Uh, 
Things got so bad that Mrs. Murphy turned to the church for help. Father Coyle from McGuire's Bridge visited the house and watched for himself as mysterious shapes appeared and disappeared on the wall and he stood inside the house. He also washed pots and pans that would suddenly fly across the room on their own. Another witness to these events was the MP, MP military police. I guess. K. Here Healy, who could simply not believe what he was seeing. Father Coyle was given permission to do not one, but two exorcisms performed in the house. It was said that during these exorcisms, bed sheets would rise off the bed, cups and plates would fly around the room, and deafening groans could be heard coming from upstairs. Both exorcisms. <laughs> that wasn't the poltergeist. <laughs> that was Mrs. Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> Intense moans. At least Mr. Murphy knew what he was doing, even after death. <laughs> They kept him around and used that rigor mortis on. <laughs> oh my God, we are we're so done. <laughs> and here we have the first story of necrophilia. <laughs> Damn it! All right. <laughs> both both exorcisms were among the very few exorcisms to be carried out in Ireland. Unfortunately, they didn't work. And the Murphy family continued to live in the house with the poltergeist. Why haven't we been canceled yet, Ben? Probably because nobody gives a shit about us. <laughs> Fucking cowards. <laughs> <laughs> the Murphys were understandably terrified. They had hoped the exorcisms might work. However, the poltergeist activity in the house seemed to be getting worse. It is also said that the friends and neighbors started to blame the Murphys for practicing witchcraft, therefore bringing this entity upon themselves. Now, I, I want to uh, say this because I don't think I put it in my notes, but I had read that the church started those rumors because of the failed exorcisms. They were like, oh, he can't really look like a failure. <laughs> that boy is, is a... Foo diggling with the with the devil. He found a fucking book. I mean, your theory makes a lot of sense. I think that's what it is. Um, there were claims that Mrs. Murphy's son had found a book in the forest near Cooneen called The Legions of Doom and was supposed to give instructions on how to practice satanic rituals, how to contain contact demons etc the son started to develop an unhealthy interest in the spirit world and was supposed to have tried to raise a demonic spirit in the house it was this spirit it was this story among others that became the last straw for the murphys and they decided to leave their home and set sail for america because in america we welcome your ghosts and hauntings but, much to the horror of the Murphys, it seemed like the poltergeist. See, this would be the perfect time, Mrs. Murphy, instead of as poltergasm, because Mr. Murphy's still banging from the dead, you know. <laughs> it's a poltergasm. <laughs> was, was he dead by this time? Aye. Oh, oh, fuck. All right, then. And that was for the rigor mortis thing. Oh yeah, I didn't. Stiffy. I just thought we were kidding about that. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. He was actually I mean, dead. He was dead. Oh yeah. shit. I. All right then. Yeah, they were using his wee wee <laughs> that had been rigor mortified. Thank you for the technical description of how that would work, Jake. <laughs> God, kids, watch this. <laughs> Jake Nye, the science guy. <laughs> Jake, 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 Jake. Okay. Um, it seemed like the poltergeist had followed them on the boat to America, 
It is well documented that the passengers on the ship complained vigorously about the rapping and banging noises that were coming from Murphy's cabin. <laughs> the noises became so bad that the captain himself went personally to Mrs. Murphy and tell her to stop making so much noise in her cabin. And uh, if she didn't, her and her darling children were going right overboard. <laughs> God damn. Well, harsh. Shut Noisy. up, lady, or we're tossing you over the side, and your kids do. <laughs> Especially your kids. <laughs> you don't need that many. <laughs> that, that makes women and children first and gives it a whole new meaning, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it is stated that the captain did not believe that there was poltergeist on the ship, but did, however, threaten that he would throw them off the ship if the noise continued. It is known that the poltergeist activity did follow them to their new home in America, but over time the manifestations and the rappings subsided and eventually stopped con completely allowing the family to get on with their lives, and one of the girls, the youngest, was so traumatized that they sent her ass to a nut house for the remainder of her days. But... As for the Cunin house in Ireland, there's still a ghostly present to this very day. Ooh. Now, for some people's first-hand accounts. First, we'll hear from Mr. Murphy. I couldn't get any fucking sleep. She just wanted it. Day and night. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not sorry at all. That was a joke, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> On Saturday, I felt uneasy walking up the path towards the house. I don't really believe in ghosts. However, the Kunin ghost house has such a massive reputation and the story behind it that it would take a very cynical person not to feel a little spooked by being there as i walked into the house i could feel a distinct chill and i will admit i felt uneasy unfortunately there is evidence that in recent times some people started using the house as a drinking den cigarette butts and cans of beer can be seen scattered along the ground I imagine people have gone there to tell ghost stories on Halloween night. Despite this, there is still a ghostly atmosphere, and I certainly wouldn't spend a night in the house. No Marian... balls. No balls. We'll do it. Send I'll... us some money to get there, and we'll do it. I'll do it right now. Not right now. It's a long trip. It is. Like in 12 hours or something. And we have to be quiet on the on the boat, otherwise we get tossed overboard. Right. <laughs> At least they didn't fly. I mean, that's fair. Ah. <laughs> Marion Goodfellow, one of UK's top spiritual mediums, visited the house in 2010. She said that it is probably the scariest place she has ever visited. She felt the presence of a man as she walked closer to the house and she said that the man was very angry and did not want her there. Although I certainly didn't come into contact with the dead on Saturday, I definitely felt that I shouldn't be there. Either, oh, my cousin said he felt the same thing. I'm sure people will have their own thoughts and ideas about the Kunin ghost house. Some will say it's haunted. Others will say why stop? There's no such thing as ghost, you dumbass. Or maybe you'll share my feelings on it and that, yes, it's unlikely that you will come into contact with the dead. However, there are a few places in Ireland that have more of a spiritual presence. And you will get the feeling that there is something that is not right about the Kunin house. Now you ready for the fun one? I'm always ready for the fun one. 
tell me, Benjamin, you remember our uh, our vampire episode, yes? Yes, vaguely. And it was like tuberculosis and like that kind of shit that vampires got blamed and all that. Correct. Well, in Ireland, they did things a little bit differently. And how was that? Well, they blamed the wee little fellas for being vampires. The wee little fellas? I The leprechauns? No, 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 oh. no. Just sharp Dwarfs. people in general. <laughs> Dwarfs, yes. Dwarfs! <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yep. So, mm. this is a fun story I found. Uh, and it's about the Irish king Abhartok. Many years ago, there lived in the lands east of Foyle between Dungiven and Garvog in the Glen of the Eagle, Glen Yulin, a chieftain or petty king called Abhartok. His name implies that he was small or a dwarf. Hold on. I, I need to write some of these names down because they'd be great for a D&D game. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to? I mean, maybe. <laughs> have you send me your notes when we're done. Okay. Uh, his name simply implies smaller dwarf. It may be that he was injured in battle through accident or possibly because of wizardry for the people of this time were great warriors, and they liked their rulers to be manly, brave, and strong. However, this is conjecture, and all we know of him that he was quite an evil man, a wizard even, hated and feared by his own clan and neighboring clans. He was a wee little guy who was angry. He had Napoleon syndrome. That is it. Next dwarf, next, next D&D campaign. Dwarf wizard for the BBEG. <laughs> Deal. Um, so the king, Petty King, the little fella, was also a jealous man and suspected his wife of having an affair, so he decided to spy on her. He climbed out of his window of his castle one night in an effort to catch her in the act, but he slipped and fell to his death. His body was discovered in the morning by the people, Believed that he was gone, they threw a party, had their pints of Guinness, uh, quickly buried him standing upright as befitting of his status, uh, but they were in for a shock. The very next day, the little king appeared demanding bulls of his people's blood fresh cut from their wrists. The terrified clans people complied through sheer terror but they contacted a neighboring chieftain Cathan or as some call it Cathron there's more names for you and begged him to deliver them from the evil Amyarbe his name was Catherine <laughs> I didn't want to read it like that but yes <laughs> Kathran. Apparently he was a giant of a dude. He was like seven foot something and just massive. To take out the wee little guy. Yeah, what a bully. He's got to go he fight a little our... midget guy. So, Kathran agreed to do this for the people. So he waited for the wee guy and killed the fuck out of him. After which, he buried him again, standing up. But there is no keeping a good little fella down. So, at the very next day, the little fella came back with his bowl and demanding it was filled from the wrists of his people. Um, incensed, Catherine once again slew the evil creature and again buried him in a remote grave. Again, and the next morning, there was the blood drinker demanding his bowl of blood. In total bewilderment, Catherine could only turn to the local saint, Eogan, for help. Eogan 
listened to the sorry tale and deliberated and prayed about the situation. His advice to Catherine was that as Arbitac had was already dead, he could not be killed again. Uh, the only way to stop him was to pierce his heart with a sword made from a yew tree. You put him in the ground upside down, carry him with ash branches and thorns. When this was done, place a heavy stone slab over the grave, which could never be raised, otherwise Arbitac would once again come looking for his bloody breakfast. Catherine followed the saint's advice and duly impaled and interred the deadly dwarf as instructed. To this day, Arbitac lies beneath the stone slab. In the Irish language, this place is called Leact Abatac and is uh, basically... Slaughter Bartok. The memorial stone or monument of the dwarf. One can visit this grave, but should beware. The local people are still very wary of this site, and it has been reported that even recently people have had rather bad experiences with it. So what you're saying is, is we need a couple shovels. Or at least something to move the big ass slab. We're gonna we're gonna go get that dude. How dangerous can he be? He's just a real, real little guy. <laughs> we can punt the little bastard. Yeah, I think I got a size advantage on him right now. <laughs> Since we're going uh, wrestling, I think Hornswoggle. Hornswoggle. Has, uh, I think he's got a size uh, advantage on this guy. We'll, we'll put him in a match. See who comes out on top, Hornswoggle or a little wizard. It's going to be Hornswoggle. You bet your ass it is. Vince McMahon won't have it any other way. And what Vinnie no. Mac says goes. Is he, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he pretty much down. retired, I guess. I don't know. I, I haven't actually watched WWE in a very long time. Me neither. But I don't even know if Hornswoggle's still fighting. But if he does, he's still winning. Yep, sure. Mm -hmm. Whether he is or not. He's got it. Aye. <laughs> this story is called The Faceless Lady of Belvely Castle. What happened to her face? Mm -hmm. You'll find out. Oh. His head fell off. <laughs> I moved the thing so I can see it now. <laughs> I'm glad I missed this. All right. There is a famous beauty who lived in the Belvely Castle, overlooking Cork Harbor in the 17th century, and word of her ethereal comeliness spread far and wide. It reached the ears of a local lord by the name of Clon Rockenby. Clon. Clon. <laughs> Clon Rockenby. It's a cool name. And he declared he must have her for his wife. Her name was Lady Margaret Hodnett, and although she was quite fond of her own reflection in the mirror, she didn't find Lord Rockenby to her taste at all. So, however often he asked for her hand in marriage, she would often again refuse. So, I just want to say this because I found it. Um, Lord Rockenby was a booty call. They would do their, their uh, I guess, premaritals all the time, and each time he would ask to marry her, and she'd be like, get out of here. Call an Uber. Wow, that's um, rough. And the dude caught the feelings? He caught the feelers. Who? Been there. Have you? <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Everyone pray for Ben. After the last humiliating refusal, Rockenby decided to take her for his wife, whether she liked it or not. So she did not feel so inclined, and he roused up his armies and went to war. He reckoned the Hodnet, that's her last name, pampered so long in lap of luxury, would fold over easily 
before his show of arms. Sounded well, like she already folded over easy. <laughs> she's not an egg. Her and Mrs. Murphy got a lot in common. <laughs> Wonder how many kids she had. <laughs> she fell down the royal stairs. I don't want to say that. <laughs> Oops. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> well, he couldn't have been more mistaken, for they held out in her castle for an, a whole year before opening the gates to him. She had opened the gates a few times before that. <laughs> if she hadn't, maybe it wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> Upon entering, he went directly for his bride to be, but was appalled to see how thin and shriveled she had become be- out of starvation. His lust thwarted. In rage, he smashed her favorite mirror just before her brother ran him through with a sword. After this, Margaret went slowly insane. She went from mirror to mirror to see if her luscious beauty had returned. But it hadn't. She was a dried, shriveled skank. And she lived out the rest of her days never leaving the castle. Local legend has it that her ghost still roams the halls and gardens of this castle, sometimes wearing a white veil, sometimes with no face at all. Her shade sometimes rubs a place in the wall as if touching a mirror, and that spot is on the stone is smooth to the touch. Interesting. Oi! So... Beware of intercourse. Too much intercourse, especially. Beware of little vampires, not the Disney variety. And, uh, yeah. That's the darker history of Ireland. Well, all right there. I... That, uh, so... Yeah. Is there anything you want to say about any of those stories? Um, other than the fact that the names in them are really cool, no, not really. Like, that is the kind of shit that I would think would lead to hauntings, though. Pounding? I know. <laughs> Premarital sex. <laughs> hey, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't your house very haunted? <laughs> I had on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for spending your time with us here on the Paranatural Podcast. Uh, you know we love you, and we thank you for all the support, for the listening, for the sharing the show. And if you enjoy the show, share the show with a friend. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. We could use more of those people. And until next time, good night. Good night, my friends. <laughs>